Sometimes I feel like I'm going a little nuts. I mean, it's not hard to understand why. In the last week in America, we've seen a spy balloon, a train derailment in Ohio that's causing literal acid rain, and aliens in Montana, I guess? There's a lot going on. But I feel like in a way it's fairly easy to process these random anomalies in the news cycle because they come in with a bang and there's at least some logistical reasoning for why these things are the way they are and why we care about them. But over the last few weeks, I've been taking notice of a trend creeping into online culture that I just can't seem to wrap my head around. It's the resurgence of Family Guy memes. Like, they're literally everywhere, on Twitter, on TikTok, in GIF and sound, in video form. It feels like you literally can't escape it. But how and why? And maybe it's always been like this and I just haven't taken notice until now, which is what I was starting to assume was the case the more I thought about it. But then I came across this article that confirmed my suspicions that I wasn't the only one having this weird realization. This story from Vice, which I'll link in the description below, talks about some recent data to support the assertion that the show is becoming more popular and therefore more relevant online. According to Google Trends, Family Guy peaked in popularity between 2007 and 2014 before experiencing kind of a low point in terms of general interest. But as of spring of last year, the pendulum has been swinging back in the animated sitcom's favor, with interest in the show propelling to its highest level since 2015. And it's not just that people are searching for it online, they're really watching it too. According to television stats, it's the eighth most watched show across television platforms as of this last December. So what exactly is counting for this bizarre change of heart from audiences? My theory based on this data is that there's sort of a reverse Rick and Morty effect happening that I guess seems to be a trend with a lot of popular animated series. Rick and Morty, which go watch this video if you haven't if you want a deeper dive into this whole thing, started out as cool, but due to a number of influencing factors over time, devolved into having to permanently wear the cringe label. Bob's Burgers also had a weird trajectory in this way too. When the show first started, it was not initially super well received, often being the butt of the joke in comparison to other animated comedy juggernauts like Family Guy or even The Simpsons. But over time, it started to assume its own unique identity and still remains one of the most popular and merchandisable franchises out there. All of this to say that animated comedies take a while to find their footing with certain audiences, and those audiences can also turn on them pretty quickly. So let's zone in on why that is and what's happening with Family Guy specifically. And of course, to do that, we're going to have to get into a bit of quick history. Comedian and animator Seth MacFarlane first conceived the idea for Family Guy while studying animation at the Rhode Island School of Design. After a series of animated shorts that caught the attention of executives at Fox, MacFarlane was given the green light to start working on the series, which aired its first episode in 1999. It aired for several seasons with a bit of controversy mixed in here and there because this was the 90s and was actually canceled at the end of its third season. However, once Cartoon Network purchased the rights to the series from Fox and started airing it in the Adult Swim programming block, the series actually saw a cult-like success and resurgence both in live viewers and in DVD sales. Once Fox ultimately saw the show's profitability, they began ordering new episodes and the rest is history. The show remained pretty popular going into the early 2010s, but then hit what I'd like to call the cringe saturation point, which wasn't really about the show itself. Seth MacFarlane is still, after all these years, more or less the face of Family Guy the way that Justin Roiland was the face of Rick and Morty. But unlike Roiland, there was a period of time where Seth decided to venture outside of the world of animated comedy to rather mixed results. I mean, on paper, it made perfect sense. He's a good-looking white dude, a pretty talented voice actor, and has many other unexpected talents like being a professionally trained jazz singer of all things. It seemed like for a brief moment that he could maybe translate those skills to make himself more than just, well, the creator of Family Guy. And so that endeavor started with the release of the film Ted in 2012, which all things considered actually did pretty well for a live action comedy, which we don't see much of anymore. But this movie sort of became a cultural moment that teetered on annoying for many people, especially because the character of Ted voiced by McFarlane was essentially Peter Griffin copy and pasted onto a new character model. So if Family Guy's immature style of humor got on your nerves, this wasn't exactly going to win you over either. You had sexual intercourse with a co-worker on top of the produce that we sell to the public. I fucked her with a parsnip last week, and I sold the parsnip to a family with four small children. That took guts. We need guts. I'm promoting you. 
you got a lot of problems, don't you? And then in 2013, Seth MacFarlane hosted the Oscars, which was probably the biggest departure from anything he had done up until that point. And like Family Guy in a lot of ways, it was not received well by normies. I don't remember this super clearly because I chose to black out all of high school from my memory, but I think the thing that most people recall from this whole situation was the We Saw Your Boob song, which was probably a little too crass and juvenile for Hollywood's biggest night. And finally, in 2014, McFarlane released A Million Ways to Die in the West, a comedy that was met with mostly negative reviews by critics and left little to no cultural impact at the time. So I think this is probably what contributed to Family Guy's lack of good graces in the public eye. Seth McFarlane had his laundry list of cringy moments over this period of time, and because many of them were noted for being immature and a little off-putting due to a lack of overall seriousness, I think many people, fans of adult animation included, started to rail on the show for coming off the same way. The series wasn't edgy and subversive anymore, it was overdone and lazy, and because of the show's style and humor, it became rather easy for those critics to pick apart. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, I don't think I need to break down the plot of Family Guy for you. What I will talk about, though, is this unique style of humor that I just mentioned. Family Guy is a sitcom-style show where each episode is its own isolated storyline. There are rarely ever any through lines that are permanent, in fact they tried it once when they were running out of ideas and it didn't really work. But throughout the basic plot of an episode, the script will be filled with tons of what have become known as cutaway gags. Instead of explaining what that means, I'll give you a quick example. Some money for groceries and a list of a kid's schedules. The fat man in charge for a week? He's gonna be in over his head, like when he was a boxing coach. Punch him! Punch him again! Punch him! Punch him now! Again! Now you're getting punched! Punch back! Don't let him hit you! Get out of the way! Punch him! You know what I'm gonna tell you. I gotta punch you him. You gotta punch him more. The cutaway gags have sort of become synonymous with the show to the delight of some and the annoyance of others. The style has been critiqued for just being, you know, a thing that fills the episode runtime rather than an actual joke. Even the animators started poking fun at their over-reliance on it in the later seasons followed by Japanese Abe Lincoln and then Monkey Rabbi. Hey, where's the Monkey Rabbi? Here's your Torah. You'll be here on Tuesday at 9. Check in with Shirley. You're gonna need me this week? Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe Friday. Uh, now, where are the gays? Over here. No, no, no. The really cartoony gays. Yoo-hoo! There you are. We're gonna need you guys all week. But in a way, I think this gives the show an endless life cycle outside of an actual episode. The most important thing about the cutaway gags are that you don't need context, and that lends itself well to the weird, timeless nature of reaction memes on Twitter and TikTok. For example, this meme of Lois shooting Peter has been used in multiple reaction tweets. You don't need the context for this to be funny, it just kind of is, you know? It's over the top and goofy and gets to the point even if the point is rather nonsensical. And that random absurdist humor still works even when cut from episodes where the gag is part of the main plot. For example, this episode where Peter buys a horse is arguably funnier when taken out of context. Here's the original clip from the show paired with a TikTok that uses the gag as a sound. Peter, the horse is here. Peter, the horse is here. And I haven't watched the newer episodes of the show in a long time, but from what I've seen online from the more recent seasons, it seems like the writers have gotten better at constructing jokes that don't rely as much on the cutaway gags. This clip I'm about to play was circulating on Twitter for a long time, and basically the premise is that Peter accidentally gets hypnotized into eating his mother-in-law's box. Yeah, I know, I never said we were going for the most sophisticated style of humor here, and this is the moment where Lois realizes what happened. It's about 7.30. Why? Oh my god, oh my god! <sighs> And although it's, you know, juvenile humor, most people were praising the clip for being a well-built setup to a joke, and also crediting the voice actor for pulling off such an insane scream. Maybe I'm wrong, but in addition to the popularity of older, out-of-context clips of the show circulating online, newer moments in the series are winning over a much younger, different fan base than it ever really had. Now, of course, there's some gray area here with how McFarlane's humor is being received by this new audience. For example, this clip was also circulating out-of-context of the episode, where 
Stewie goes on the classic boomer-brained rant about gender progressive activism and how it's poisoning the youth of America or whatever. Stewie, trust me, boys can't get periods. Brian, it's 2022. There's no such thing as a boy anymore. Or a girl. Just a vast sea of chubby theys and them, so coddled by their sanctimonious woke parents who think activism is virtue signaling on Instagram. If Martin Luther King could come back and see what they were doing in his name, he'd never stop throwing up. But the clip stops short of Brian explaining to Stewie why his points are bullshit, and like many of the replies to this tweet explain, not only is this a disingenuous portrayal of the actual scene and what the writers are trying to get across, but if you're taking your morals from Family Guy of all places, you may just want to start looking elsewhere for your philosophical takes. So yeah, Family Guy has beaten the cringe allegations. It's 2023 and anything can happen here, folks. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to enjoy my kinetic sand, subway surfer TikToks in peace because I am on a personal mission to kill any of the brain cells that I once had. Thanks for watching. Remember to follow me on my socials and subscribe to my second channel. I actually just posted a video on there yesterday making fun of a content farm, so go tune into that if you do feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time. If I can't have PETA, no one should. I might. I might kill my PETA. Not the best idea. Jaw and Quagmire is next. How'd I get here?